Hello, colleagues, and welcome to the next episode of DINCAST, where today I'm joined by Will Butler-Adams, OBE, uh, who's the CEO of Brompton Bicycles. And we're going to be talking all sorts of things, I'm sure, uh, around innovation and uh, how COVID has affected him and his business this year. So, Will, welcome. Thank you. Um, I am sitting here in the factory. Um, I've, I've, it's been a flat out day, so I'm now sitting in the comfy chair. I've got my cup of tea. I've got my biscuit. So I'm raring to go. You're raring to go. That's what we like, sir. Paramedics and presenters, they're the two people we want to just crack on, don't we? Mm. So, um, Will, for those sort of DIN members who are watching or listening to this, um, do you want to just, you know, perhaps I've not heard of you before, sort of just tell us a little bit about yourself, your leadership journey in Brompton. Oh, my God. So um, I'm involved in making a little bike that folds up. It's called the Brompton. And we make it in London. And I was um, at the time I, I was 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 involved in running chemical a PET plant in uh, on Wilton in Middlesbrough. And then I bumped into somebody on a bus in London and weird things happen. I was 27, thought I was going off to do an MBA, but took a slight deviation met a mad inventor he made bikes in london and um that was 18 years ago and there were 25 of us we're now just over 500 staff and um it's been a hell of a journey a tremendous adventure bloody good laugh and the last seven months haven't disappointed either so it's been um interesting it's never boring this little life of ours that we're all you know living out no i'm sure and we'll we'll, we'll come on to that but i mean in, in terms of sort of you know, the, the Brompton story. I mean, I, I, I sort of refer to it as, as the apple of folding bicycles. It's vastly engineered quality product that lasts four or five times longer than any sort of other bike. And, that. and that's part of your deliberate strategy, isn't it? In terms of, you know, you've got lifelong fans of, of the product. I mean, just, just say a little bit more about how it, how it is actually engineered and built. Yeah. So really what we're trying to do is make something that's useful that's it and when you stand back and look at our lives we have so many people permanently persuading us or trying to persuade us to buy a whole load of stuff that we don't really need there's tons of it every time you open a magazine turn the radio on it's just more guff buy this it'll make you sexy buy this it'll make you do this that and the other you buy it all and of course half of it's not not delivered and you don't need it so it was driven by andrew the inventor's idea that he wanted something it didn't exist so he invented it and we've built a brand, bizarrely, but we're not interested in the brand. We're just interested in the product. And I think people are too busy and too, in too much of a rush to, I don't know, have exit strategies, make a quick buck. Um, and particularly in manufacturing, it takes time and you need to listen and evolve and care about detail. And the difference between something that's sort of nice and something that's delightful is detail and if you care about detail it delivers um, delight in your customers but it also delivers um, profitability because you get things right there's less waste it, you understand what you're doing you communicate well and that all ends up in a delightful product that's well made from the start and the customer enjoys so it's a far more fun place to work because you're you're, you're trying to do something beautiful rather than cutting corners rushing it and knowing it's a bit crappy and you've got to do it because they told you you had to so on that basis you know we built a bike that people enjoy they tell their friends and we sold a few more and when i've sort of been down here before and i think it's in reception you've got this sort of <clears throat> sort of uh, strap line up there which is about changing the way we live in cities and is, Correct. That, is that your mission? Yeah, and I think, you know, I th 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 there is a sort of total, I mean, it's understandable, but people are obsessed with money. But if you start from the premise that most of the stuff that you buy, you probably don't need, what on earth do you need all that money for? Well, you know, what you need is time with your friends. You need to buy beautiful things that last a long time, that, that, that add value to your life. But we can't keep buying tat because the, the, the little mother earth can't can't keep delivering that because every time we're doing it we're extracting and, and and then we're shoving it under the ground or polluting somewhere so i think we need to reconsider how we want to as a society engage with the planet that we live on and we know that we've got we've got some clear signs telling us that the way we're currently going it ain't, ain't going to work so um yeah i mean it, this bicycle is is, is a tiny little contribution um, it's a useful tool. Um, 
but it's not the solution to the world's problems, but it's a teeny weeny little the positive step. And if we get enough people doing that in their businesses and, and contributing in a positive way, um, then we'll solve some of these bigger problems. And also, I think the consumer, um, and this was going on before COVID, but it's been you know, exacerbated afterwards. People have had time to reflect on their lives. They've had time to see what a city's like when it's not full of cars and they can take their children for a bike ride. The consumer is, is slightly thinking, well, am I going to spend my money with this company that believes in this? like giving them shareholders as much money as they can and who gives us stuff and it's all shirt term or are they going to put their money with this company that of course it needs to make a profit because it needs to innovate but their philosophy their purpose is one of trying to work with the planet and and, and invest in the community and create valuable products um so i'm hoping that the consumers will vote with their their feet and increasingly businesses will will not dismiss sustainability and community as a sort of fad and recognize they're a very important part of running your business. So you, you mentioned in your opening remarks there, actually the last sort of, you know, 11 months, 10 months have been really, really challenging and difficult. Um, obviously, you know, my members are working in the social housing space, so they've had their mm. issues. What's it been like in, in, in your world in terms of what's been thrown at you and how have you responded? The interesting thing is the um, is that our supply chain from China was was interrupted, particularly from Taiwan and 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 and, and some some stuff comes in from China. It was interrupted, but of course we still had lots of containers on the sea, so actually it wasn't that bad. The bigger problem was in Europe and in the UK, where businesses panicked, and literally one day to the next, oh my god, I've got to close down, I've got to close down, shut everything down. I mean, the world's coming to an end, I've got to shut down. And I think when, when things go wrong, that is when leadership is tested. And the first thing to do when things go wrong, and I've had lucky experience of getting involved in I, I, my ability to bugger things up. It's so fantastic that I've spent most of my life getting things wrong. So I've got quite good, good at dealing with it. And when things go wrong, my immediate response is to go calm and just relax. Right. Okay. So we have a serious flipping problem. Let's calm down because the only way we're going to deal with this is having a level head. And when it came in at us, I sat down with my team and we discussed it in a calm way one day to the next. Quite frankly, we've got time to really debate it. When we looked at it, the information that we were getting was that this disease was, was going to affect the vulnerable and the elderly. And that the indications coming out of China and Asia were that the young and healthy were actually, it was less serious. So I decided, and it's, you have to take decisions in a crisis. You can't end up having chatting to everybody. I decided we were going to stay open. And the only thing that would cause us to close is if the government came along and forced us to close. But I wasn't going to volunteer to give in. I was going to close if I was told I had to. And if I was told I had to, I'd close straight away. But until that point, I was going to continue. And I sat down and I did a video every single day through the first lockdown. Every day. Small little video on my phone to the staff. Because in February, all the vulnerable staff went. And when we went to lockdown, anyone who didn't have to went. And I said to the guys in the first video, guys, I'm taking this decision. We're going to stay open. The risk, I believe, are to the vulnerable and the elderly you lot all disappeared in February and you can stay at home as long as you like. The rest of us, actually, I don't believe the risks from this virus are that high. I think the bigger risk to us is if we lose our jobs. And certainly for a lot of my staff, and I have a lot of people on, on the shop floor, if they lost their job, that would be it. They wouldn't get a job for another three years because we I could tell we were going into a recession. And, 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 and so we took a long-term view. I was very honest with my staff and the staff were very fearful. They were very worried, but by and large, they backed that plan. And because I was honest, I was vulnerable in my talks. I didn't know I have all the answers. I was sharing with them everything I knew, even though there was a lot of fear and we did have people who were very scared. We held together as a team. There was a belief in what we were doing and we carried on trading. And I think that is the test of leadership is is not following the crowd, not going to the extreme. Whatever that extreme is, it's always easy to go to the extreme, but life isn't black and white and running a business and looking after your children. It's not black and white. You need to, you need to be sophisticated and take a calculated risk. 
risk is so important in life and in business. And if you just run to one end, you're not doing your staff or your business justice. And you talked a lot about decision making there and some pretty big decisions that actually clearly rested on your sole shoulders around this will. Did you have to adapt or change your approach to taking decisions? Because as I say, nobody's faced a global pandemic before. No, but it's no different to any other decision. If I make, I've made decisions in Brompton with regards to the company. If we don't get them right, you know, the bike could fail and someone could hurt themselves. I had to do a recall of 144,000 bikes and, and take a decision that was a huge commercial knock for the company. But the consequences of potentially people hurting themselves was, was something that I wasn't prepared to take. But no decision is black and white. It's always grey. And you know, you have to weigh it up. And we all have our experience. And hopefully in our jobs, we've got experience of our industry. And therefore, that helps us make that decision. And I never, I take the decision, but I take the decision with a council of people who who have the knowledge in my team, and I trust them. And I'm not one of these people who's so gung ho that I'm always, you know, just arrogantly, you know, charging in front, waving my flag. I'm often told that I'm talking complete tosh by my team and I'll change my decision as a result because I respect them and their opinion highly. So you've talked earlier on about the importance or the critical importance to Brompton of its ability to innovate and I know we've talked over the years and I've actually learned a lot personally about your approach to sort of innovation and things so could you sort of explain for listeners and viewers you know how you view innovation how you've led innovation within Brompton? It comes back to the, t- the thing I was talking about earlier. It's it's leadership and risk. And the more I think about it, I'm, I mean, uh, risk and, and having been through the last seven months, risk is so important. It's so important that our children are allowed to take risk. They're encouraged to take risk, that they make mistakes, that they fall out of the tree and it didn't kill them. And if we have, I mean, just the families and the children that have gone through this coronavirus, they'll be more anxious because, you know, you mustn't do this or you mustn't do that. You've got to be careful. You've got to, you can touch this person. You can't touch that. I mean, it's just more and more anxiety and and that's not healthy but i mean give you an example we you've got to just go for stuff dilly dallying waiting for the research waiting for 10 people to pat you on the back and all agree life is like that opportunities come and go risks come and you've got to respond quickly otherwise you get caught out we had one of our problems was our staff we continued to make but our staff were being stopped by the police and we had um we had some family members saying to our staff, well, you know, well, why, why are you going into work at Brompton? That's not the NHS. How can that be critical? And um, interestingly, we had, we had Bart's Hospital approach us and they said, look, could, we lend, could you lend us some bikes? Because some of our doctors and nurses um, would love to use a bike. The streets are quiet and they don't want to go on public transport. Oh, yeah, yeah. We said, yeah, we will lend you 25 bikes. And word got out and then they said, well, could we have a few more? So we dug around because we've got our bike car scheme. So then we lent them in, like another 50. Then it was 150. And then literally we sucked out every last bike we had that wasn't being used. That's 200 bikes. And they wanted more. And this all happened in about 10 days. And so um, we just thought on our feet, well, what the hell are we going to do? So we, we set up a crowdfunding page. It took us two days to set the crowdfunding page up. In 18 days, we raised 320 grand. We put in 100 grand and we made nearly 800 bikes. And we, we called it Wheels for Heroes. And we made a, a, a fantastic campaign. And we have supplied um, those 800 bikes to now about 4,000 people um, in the NHS. And basically, they can take the bike um, for 30 days for free. We'll get it to them. It's there. They can either take it out of the dock. In some cases, we ship it to the hospital. If they like it, they can then um, uh, lease it for another three months. Um, at basically next to nothing. I think it's £15 a pound a day. And then we try, and if if they've in, enjoyed it, we try and then get them onto a bike. Not necessarily our bike. I mean, any old bike. But this is about bringing people back to cycling. And then we recycle those bikes back in, to, to other members of the NHS because we have a backlog of staff who want to use them. And it's just been such an exciting journey. And we've had such fun We've met fascinating people and it doesn't matter whether you're the surgeon or whether you're involved in caring for people and making sure that you're keeping their, 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 their um, beds clean and all that. It, it, anyone has been taking these bikes. And, um, and that, the, you know, there was a, a reasonable amount of investment from us, but the, the bit that mattered was it gave us pride. 
It made us feel like we were contributing. We all got behind it, the whole staff. We were so happy we were able to do something to contribute to what was a real crisis for our country. And there was so much fear. And it, it was just totally awesome. And there are all sorts of interesting things have come out of that. And then we've realized what we were actually doing is a subscription model. So even though we're doing it as a subscription model for free, it's a subscription model. And so we've, we're evolving our bike car uh, offering to offer not only daily, but also subscription. And it's just brilliant. And innovation is the mother of invention. And, and it, it's it's that sort of stuff. And it's just not being afraid to say, well, why not? Give it a go. Have a crack. Everybody's so fearful. It comes back to risk. Oh, no, no. I have to wait and ask. I have to wait and check. I need to do more research. Just do it in a small way and quickly find out. And again, sort of linking in with that, I know you've told me this story a few times before, but I remember you had concerns about how innovative Brompton actually was and you didn't feel that the culture was right and I think people have come to you and said, oh, we don't have enough money to sort of do this. And then you set up a, a fund to sort of address yes. that. But, it, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just the fund, was it, that uh, helped you get that? No, but it's, that it's, it's the same thing. People are being taught right from wherever they are. They're taught, you know, oh, it's, it's, you, know you, you want to do this because what's the upside? What's the return on investment? How fast are we going to get the payback? And the trouble is, Actually, when you're being innovative, when, you're, when, you've, when you've got a thing that you know is going to work and you're spending big money, yes, 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 you have to do your business case, you have to justify it, what's the return on investment, all this gubbins. But when you're in the early sort of muddling along and is it worth it, isn't it worth it, is it going to work, you, you don't want to be looking at the upside. You want to be looking at the downside and you want to be going, listen, sod the upside. None of us quite know where it's going to go. And if we do guess, we'll probably be over enthusiastic. What well, if it goes belly up, if it doesn't work because it's pretty risky, you know, what, what are we in for? Is it going to affect our brand? Can we afford it? So I set this thing up called the Fuck It Fund. And it started at five grand. And it was like, if you've got an idea, just do it. Just do it. Sod it. Do it. Give it a go. As long as it doesn't cost more than five grand. And at the time, that was quite a lot of money for us. And as long as someone could, and the downside is very measurable. It's not waffly. It's near the upside. Could be here. It could be here. It could be, it could be infinite. The downside's much more measurable. It's much more certain. So worry about the downside. Get certainty. It's only five grand, do it. We're now probably in around about, we're, we're probably, the fuck it fund's now at about 100 grand at Brompton. So, you know, it's, a, it's bigger, but we can afford to punt it. And as long as you know that it's not going to be more than that, what have you got to lose? And if you find you spend the money and it's a total disaster, thank God you didn't spend a million on it because you might have bust the firm. So even though it's a negative, it's a positive negative. And that attitude to getting stuff done to trying i mean i went to some of these these things where people are talking about export who am i going to and all the advisors will go and speak to the experts go and speak to this organization that organization then you can do some market research i said rubbish if you want to learn about export just say right who wants to come on a holiday to south korea we're gonna go and drink some funny beer eat some kimchi and, and, and we'll time it when there's a show in South Korea. And a couple of us, it's going to cost us five grand all in. And we'll have a bloody good laugh and call it a team building trip. Just do it. When are we going? You know, in a month. You pile out there. You have great beer. You meet interesting people. You, you, you eat tons of kimchi. And you either find out whether you, your gut tells you there's a market there or you don't. But you find out in like a month rather than, ooh, do we do South Korea? Well, let's do a bit more research. The, the opportunity has gone. Yeah, yeah. Opportunities past the dawn pause is one of my my good friends. Yeah, correct. As well, and so speaking of sort of other markets, then um, you uh, explored the U.S. market um, mm -hmm. for a, for a while, and this was a big learning experience for you and, and the business, wasn't it? And I think um, this is where you introduced me to the concept of sort of risk patience. Could you tell us sort of you know what, what happened here? Well, I mean, we, we we well things are moving so fast, but um. We are patient as a company. It helps that we're privately owned. Um, I'm a great fan of, of Mr. Warren Buffett compound growth. So we've grown 20% a year compound for the last 15 years. You know, you open the papers and, you know, we're, we're all footballers earning millions of pounds or, or we're, 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 you know, the next pop star that's earning millions of pounds. But for the most of us real human beings, the world doesn't work like that. And, you know, 20% year on year growth is, is, is starts to kick in. It gets quite powerful. And business is about knowledge. It's about know-how. It's about networks. It's about trust. 
It's about suppliers and customers and, and you build relationships and that takes time. And in our case, our product's quite counterintuitive. So our philosophy has always been start early, move quickly, but be patient. Find people you like, work with people you like. Don't go, you know, with turds because it's so boring to work with people that are, are, are just no fun. And then be patient. And if your product's good enough, don't go and raise millions of pounds and do a massive campaign. I mean, that might work, but it's high risk. If you go in small but quick into a market, you start learning, you start finding out and you start adjusting. And then when you've got your, you know, once you've got your feet under the table and you've got a bit more knowledge and you built a few decent relationships, guess what? Then you're in a position to invest because you know and understand that market so much better. And, and business is littered. With, with, I mean, WeWork, Ofo, my, Mobike, this sort of big, you know, gung-ho, you know, and, and, and actually, when you look at the businesses, even likes of Apple, he was an unknown for years. The great expression takes 20 years to become an overnight success. And that, to me, is spot on because it takes – people don't see – the pop star who spent 15 years working, doing gigs in, 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 in rubbish pubs and, and where it's empty. And then suddenly they become super famous. You know, they, they put the hours in and it's the same in business. And, and I think, you know, coming back to sort of, you know, that market you were looking at, I think I, I like the idea that you introduce these sort of risk patients KPIs to say, basically, this will help us avoid these zombie projects. Are you going to throw everything at this? And then if it doesn't work out in this sort of period of time, then actually we know that's probably not going to work. So we'll move on to somewhere else. So that, that must be a good discipline for the business. So again, it's the same. It's sort of the same thing with, with, with regards to the fuck it fund in terms of um, you, you need to delegate in business. You need to recruit people and delegation is again, it's about risk. If, you, if, you, if you're prepared to, 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 to delegate, you're prepared to take risk. The people who can't take a risk have to control everything. Oh, no, everything comes through me. No, 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 no. You can't make that decision. I'm the complete opposite. I, I, I take time to recruit people, but it's a gamble. You don't know whether they're up for it. It doesn't matter whether you're recruiting a new member of staff or even if somebody you've known for five years. If you put them in a new position with more responsibility and, and authority, are they going to sink or swim? You don't quite know. It's a gamble. But... When you decide to take that decision, you need to back it. It's no good sticking them in the job and saying, oh, six months are up. Oh, you're not doing very well. No, sorry, you're not working. I mean, like the sort of, you know, managers of football clubs. I mean, the guy's already got his foot under the table. And if he hasn't won a million games, he's out. And they want the next one in. How can that work? So the way we go about it is, you know, we, we like to give people two years. So, you know, we sit down with them. They build a plan. They've got knowledge. We give them an opportunity. Right, you've got two years and we'll back you. And, 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 you know, and hopefully, and in many cases, that investment works, but in some cases it doesn't. But you can't really qualify that after nine months. It's too early. You've got to be prepared to give it time. I know two years isn't much, but it's a lot more than a lot of businesses will give. And, and, and in two years, you, again, you know you can afford to invest for two years because you set that out at the beginning. And if in two years it isn't fulfilling, then you're honest. And you say, look, we gave it our best shot. It's maybe not right for you. Maybe we didn't give you the right training, whatever else, but we need to do, we need to change. And then you, you can't be afraid to be radical and change things quite dramatically. But it's easy to be radical if you've really, really given it your best shot. If you've only half given it your best shot, you don't quite know whether it was because you didn't really invest in it. So it might have been right or, or, or whether it was actually wrong at the outset. So you're a bit uncertain. But if you've really given it your best shot with the best people and it ain't working, well, it ain't working. So there's no point dithering over it. It ain't flicking working. So let's move on to something else. And you've mentioned a lot about failure and, and um, you know, the lessons that come from that. So I just wonder, would you share with, share with us sort of what your biggest failure has been in your eyes? And, and what did you learn from that? I would say the biggest failure I took was I took an expedition up the Amazon. And um, I took a group of people. Um, who I knew reasonably well. And the, I had been into the Amazon right in the complete middle of nowhere on my own before, which is why I organized this expedition to go back. But the mistake I made was 
I was the only person who understood what was going on. It was the sort of megalomaniac thing. And we nearly all died. It was pretty flipping hairy. And um, what happened was we had a crisis. We were starving. Things went really quite badly wrong. But when you're in a crisis, it, you can't suddenly start explaining to everybody what the problem is because you're in a crisis, you have to make a quick decision. And because none of the team knew what was going on because I hadn't shared it with them, they were extremely fearful. And I didn't have the luxury of time to, to bring them up to speed with what the, what the issues were. So I had to make an executive decision having not communicated to any of my team who all thought they might die. It was properly bad. And it was bad management. It was bad communication. Everything about it was bad. We were jolly lucky to come out in one piece. I was young, very naive. I then organized another expedition miraculously. How anybody even d decided to come anywhere near me after I'd made the first total balls up. And this time I went up a mountain. But the difference was on this occasion, we were, we were, there were eight of us. And from the very start, we were in groups of two. And each pair became the expert in a particular field. One was the expert in food, one was the expert in medicine, the other was the, the expert in kit. And they, 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 were totally, they knew more than anyone else. They were the expert. So what that meant was, if we had a crisis with medicine, it was me and those two. And they knew more than me. And if it was a crisis with kit, it was me and those two. And it was so much more fun and enjoyable. And it, it, it taught me a lesson to recruit people way better than you and let them delegate and let them be the experts. I, I, we all, I told people we're trying to climb that mountain, not that mountain, this mountain. But once I've decided what we're trying to achieve, let your team deliver because they've got the knowledge you don't. You recruit them because they have the knowledge you don't have. So allow them to deliver. Your job is to tell them where we're going. Let them deliver it. Brilliant, a brilliant example, Will. And can, can I sort of just come back to, it, I suppose, another issue that's sort of been brought to the fore around um, from COVID, which is, again, the change in the way we sort of live in cities. And I think what COVID has done is it's shone a light on, as you say, you know, the CO2 emissions and the time that people spend sort of commuting. So, you know, your, your offer about changing the live in cities has some resonance with, with my members in the, the social housing space. So mm -hmm. you've talked about the wheels for heroes, um, what about, you know, uh, uh, wheels for social housing in, in terms totally. of... Totally. Yeah. So so we have our, our bike hire scheme, which is which is what spurned the Wheels for Heroes because we, we had like 35 locations and we put the Wheels for Heroes bikes into those locations. We locked the dock down and then uh, a member of the NHS could register. The bike would be waiting for them. They put in a special code and they got the bike and, and it actually cost them a quid for the month because we had to take one pound off them to sort of make sure they weren't going to nick it. Um, but an important part of what we're doing with our bike hire is we want to engage the community that are not cycling. The vast majority of people in the UK know how to ride a bike because their parents um, feel, as all parents do, that if you can't teach your children to ride a bike, you're not a good parent. So, so there's huge pressure, but unfortunately, it's as if all you need to do is teach them how to ride a bike, and then that's fine. You've done your job, and then you, they can jump in a car or a bus or the tube, or whatever else. Um, there doesn't seem to be this ongoing encouragement, but most of us know how to ride a bike. It's good for our noggin. It's good for our heads, and we need that, and it's good for our heart. And particularly now with electric bikes, the distances you can travel are not last mile solution. They're last six mile solutions, and you'll be having a grin on your face from start to finish. And you will be doing cardiovascular on an electric bike. So we are increasingly, we've been working with developers. And as part of their 106 provision, we've been installing um, our docks. We've now got over 50 docks in the UK. So we're really beginning to build our network. And then in parallel with that, um, we've been working with some social housing where we offer uh, subsidized rates for particular communities to encourage them and again reduce the barriers to getting on a bike we don't want our bikes to be their solution for transport we want them to be a catalyst to give them the confidence to go out and get their own bike so then it frees up that that capacity for someone else to to, to, to have an experience and then have the confidence to get on and get their own bike you can pick up a bike for 20 quid. There's no reason anyone can't have a bike. But you, you need something to give them the confidence. And if you can give them something that's beautiful, shiny, new, very low cost, 
they enjoy it and then they realize what they've been missing that'll just give them the help they need i think that's something we definitely need to sort of explore with um social housing leaders will i think that's an absolutely brilliant concept and hopefully we can help you um Oh, we'd love that. To, to scale that as well. Final point then, um, for anybody watching um, and, and listening today, what one piece of advice, observation or insight would you want to share with them um, for what we've got sort of coming up over the next year or you know, however long this sort of goes on? What, what would you like them to sort of you know, remember you by? Oh, forget me. But for, the, for anyone, any of your team who are involved in uh, your sector, I think the net we, we, we have a way to run yet with this this crisis, and I, I'm repeating myself. But you need to lead, you need to lead your team. You need to nurture, look after your team, and you need to do what you feel is right. And what you, I mean, the royal you, you as a team, feel is like. But it requires leadership, and I really would caution you to um, just run to the latest advice. You, you, you as a group need to decide what you feels right, you know, and, and th- th- there are challenges everywhere. But, you know, I was listening to something on the, on the radio this morning about care homes and how they're being torn between supposedly protecting their, um, th- their clients who are the elderly and, and people with dementia and other, other illnesses. But in protecting them, they're potentially killing them because they desperately need love and familiarity of family and everything else so it isn't it isn't black and white and you've got to do what you feel is right and in life as well as in business if you genuinely do what you feel is right and you can honestly say that you're doing it for the right reason if you get it wrong that's fine because you were doing what you felt was right and it's leadership don't just do what everyone else says do what you and your team feel is right Brilliant way to finish there, Will. I always enjoy our conversations, sir. Um, you know, so many lessons we can sort of share with people there and we will genuinely, you know, look to get some uh, DIN members and housing leaders involved in the, uh, the social rent offer there as well. So look, all of which we thank you so much for taking the time to share those insights with us and uh, hope you and the team all stay safe and well. Many thanks indeed. Cheers, Ian.